Well, it's wonderful to be back here in this church, and I want to say that you can be thankful to God for this house. We've been traveling to many different churches, but let me tell you something. When I come into this house, I feel the presence of God, and God is very close to us. Hallelujah. We give God the glory and blessing. So, greetings from, first of all, the Cape in Kailitsha. Kailitsha, and they said to us, that's the most difficult place and dangerous place in the Cape. I said, not when God is with us. So we had the Eastern weekend in the Cape, and the Wednesday and Thursday we preached with Apostle George Page, and they sent greetings. He was here with the prayer meetings that we had in February in our church, and they are excited, and God is just joining us together with many, many different kinds of churches. And then last week, on Saturday, we went into Limpopo and with Pastor Amos, Amos Boweni. He's high up in the ANC government, and his wife is also um, an advocate. And they live in Pretoria, and they had the church in Pretoria, and many times we went to Pretoria to preach in his church, but with COVID, he gave up the building, and he's got a big house in the Popo where, he, where he's grown up. And he spent hundreds of thousands of rent in a, in a beautiful, very big building for the church. And they wanted us to dedicate it, but he said, let's wait with the dedication for another year because he still needs to do a lot of things on the parking area. But on the Saturday, he invited the high officials in that area and also pastors from that area. And uh, he asked us to preach and to anoint the pastor, the local pastor, and the evangelist and the elders so that they can look after the church because he stays in Pretoria. That means he can go only once a month to preach there, but he is really concerned about the area and he wants to see the area to be saved. So we had a wonderful time there. And then from there, we came our way through the game reserve. Instead of this way, we went that way. And uh, we had a wonderful time, my wife and I, and we give God the glory. Also, when we came from here, from, from Johannesburg, we picked up uh, Clarissa's father and mother from, the, from Durban, and they went with us, uh, Shailen and Mel Singh. And they were also with us there, but then Pastor Amos brought them back, and we went the other way through the game reserve. So we had a wonderful time. Greetings from all. Thank you for your prayers. And it's just wonderful to be in other churches as well. But when I come back to this church, I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I pray that God will really bless us in this, in this church and that this church will be an example to many, many other places in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Okay, I heard a story the other day from a pastor and that was transferred from his church to another church in another city and he didn't know the city. And he wanted to know where the post office is and he called the young man there that he saw and he says, young man, can you help me? Do you know where the post office is in this place? He says, yes, sir, sure, I can help you. He says, just take this road up three blocks further, turn right, and you'll see the post office. So the pastor was very happy and thankful, and he says, now, young man, if you come Sunday to our church, then I will show you the way to heaven. This young man looked at him, and he says, but, sir, if you don't even know the way to the post office, how do you know the way to heaven? <laughs> well, we went to Cape Town and we went to Lesotho. No, not Lesotho, Limpopo. We knew what God wanted us to do. And we thank God that we could bring the word of the Lord and they has changed there. It's not the last time that we're going 
And I believe that it's from this church many seeds will be sown into different areas. And it's all because of you, that you are faithful to God, and that you want this church to grow and be an example in South Africa, in this nation. All right. The word of the Lord. Genesis chapter 12, it starts off with Abraham. So from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 12 was the creation, it was the flood, and it was the Tower of Babel. And then in Genesis chapter 12 starts with Abraham. He lived in the Ur of the Chaldeans, which was a godless place. His family did not serve God. Even in his father's house, they did not serve God. And suddenly, God comes to Abram. And he said, Abram, come out. Out of what? I believe this is the word of the Lord to each and every one in this world. Believers of unbelievers, God is calling the people to come out of the world system to come to the house of the Lord. Come out. Abraham could have said no. You say to me, is it possible that God will even come to us and call us, come out? Yes and no, because after Jesus Christ died on the cross and he paid for the sins of the whole world, and he came and he brought the sacrifice to, the, to his father. The father says, now I will release the Holy Spirit to come down on the earth. And the Holy Spirit is working here in you and through you. And he is calling the people like God called Abraham. And the Holy Spirit is drawing the people, even the unsaved people. They don't know it's the Holy Spirit, but they feel something in their heart that is calling them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Get out of the world system. Get out of sin and all the things that the devil does. Because the Bible says no one comes to the Lord. No one seeks the Lord. But it's the Holy Spirit that has drawn you. And that's the reason why you are here. Because you felt a draw unto the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And when you accept the Lord as your personal Savior, what happens then is you are saved, you're a new person, and the Holy Spirit comes and he indwells you. So if you are not saved, the Holy Spirit does not indwell you, but the Holy Spirit draws you. But when you are saved, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit is with us, and he will never leave us. If you, it's your decision. So Abraham could have said no. You could have said no to the draw of the Holy Spirit. But thank God that you didn't say no. You said, yes, Lord, here I am. I give my life to you, forgive my sins, and you become part of the family of God. Now, in John chapter 14 and verse 16, let me show you how the Holy Spirit was poured out. And, 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 and uh, here in 16 it says, And I will pray the Father, that is Jesus Christ in the prayer, and he will give you another helper that he will may abide with you forever. What is that? The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The people in the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Thank God you and I, we can receive the Holy Spirit. And one of the signs of the Holy Spirit is that we can speak in tongues. Many people that have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and they do not speak in tongues, they don't know that the gift of God is in them because the Holy Spirit comes in them and you just have to use faith and to open your mouth and start speaking and the Lord will help you with more words and more words and it will become a language. And it's a language that we can pray because if I pray in the language of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit prays on my behalf. And he knows exactly what you pray. 
So praying in the Holy Spirit is very, very important. Yes, I pray in English, I pray in Afrikaans, I pray in Dutch, but I can also pray in the spirit language, and I prefer praying to God in the language of the Holy Spirit. He says, the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you, hallelujah, including everyone here in this building, you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. So to every born again believer, they receive God's life and we are drawn by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will many times put into your spirit, don't do that, don't go that way, go and bless that person. And sometimes we don't even know it's the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is with us constantly and he will lead us on the way, hallelujah. To do what Abram had to do, come out. You must have faith and obedience. That's the title of this message. Faith and obedience. If we obey, then the promises that Abraham received from the Father, when Abraham came out, those promises are still also for us. What are these promises? Number one, your descendants will inherit the land. Number one, I believe, fathers, if you really serve the Lord God the way you should, your children will be blessed. Because God is a generational God. Fathers can come and they will be a great blessing. Abraham was a blessing for many, many generations, even through Jesus Christ today to us. You say, I'm not from the seed of Abraham. It doesn't matter. If you are born again, you become the seed of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was from the tribe of Judah. And the blessings of Abraham was with him. And now it comes to you. Number two, I will make you of you a great nation. I believe that South Africa will become a very, very great nation if thousands of people in South Africa will turn to God and start worshiping the Lord. God's blessing will be with us, and I'm praying that God will save many, many people. I still believe that the greatest revival that we, the world has ever seen will come to our nation. Why? Because the Bible prophesied that the early rain and the latter rain will come together. That means the early revivals in the, in the Bible with the apostles after Jesus' time, that revival and the revival that comes in the end time, together, a double portion of blessings, we will see miracles like never before. Why? Because it's the time of God. It's the time that God wants to get his body ready. Number three, he says, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We see that with Israel. When they were in Egypt, Egypt was blessed. I believe that the families of God are fountain of life. Wherever you are, that area will be blessed because God is keeping his promise and he wants to bless every, every person around you because you are serving God. God. So God is a generational God. And God wants the families to live in harmony together. And that's one thing that I see in this time that many families are breaking up because the devil doesn't want families to live in harmony together. We bind that evil spirit that breaks up families in the name of Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ has given us authority. And we and you can use that authority to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't break up the families. So from Abraham to Isaac, 
to Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. But we see that the 10 sons of Jacob was jealous of Joseph. His father was very happy with Joseph and gave him a coat of many, many wonderful colors. And, and, and he was blessed more than the others. And those 10 brothers, they hated him. And they were jealous. They were bitter. Why is my father Jacob doing this to Joseph? And what about us? We are also the children of God. You see that the, this is what the devil brings in the families, this unity. And things will break. So when one day that his father sent Joseph to see how the ten sons are, they saw him coming and they said, let's kill him. But Reuben said, don't kill him. They threw him in a pit and then the caravan came and they sold him. And he was sold in, 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 in Egypt to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to um... All right, I'm coming there. Don't worry, hold it. They went back home and they showed him the, the garment of many colors, the coat of many colors. They killed a, a, a coat and they put the blood on it and they said, Dad, we don't know what happened to this. Is this Joseph's uh, coat? Yeah, it's his. Look, it's full of blood. Maybe a wild animal or... or, or a beast has destroyed him. They were lying. They know what happened. So Jacob mourned for many days. His family is broken up. And how can God now fulfill the promises that your generations will be inherit the land? It cannot be fulfilled because the family is broken up. And in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16... It says, but the fourth generation, the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet been complete. In other words, the promised land, the Amorites lived there. And they were not serving God. And God is a merciful God. God will draw them and, and will try to get them saved. But they didn't want to listen. And there's a time of no return. And then God says, finished. And that was the time the Amorites iniquity was fulfilled. <clears throat> and now the fourth generation will come and take possession of the land. So Joseph was bought by Potiphar. And Potiphar, but God was still with him. And, and he didn't go with hatred and bitterness about his ten brothers. He was just trusting in the Lord. And, and while Potiphar looked at him, he said, man, God's hand is upon this person. You know, if you work for a company and those that are over you can see that God is in you and you are straightforward, they will promote you. And this is what Potiphar did. He put him over the whole house and he didn't care about anything else because why? There is a young man that serves God and he is honest and he will do the right thing. But unfortunately, his wife came and wanted to lie, lay with him, lie with him, and he just ran away, but she got his coat and he pulled it off and he says, I will not do so. And then she took that coat and she accused him that he wanted to do it to her, and then they put him in prison. But in prison, the Lord is with him. It doesn't matter where you go. If you are faithful to God, God will never leave you nor forsake you. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. If God is with you, the blessing of Abraham will be upon you. So the prison, the, the head of the prison saw, whoa, this young man, he's a prisoner, but look how good. He gave the whole prison into his hand. Why? Because God's blessing is upon him. I want you to take this this morning. God's blessing can be with you. But there, there are conditions. If you look at what Joseph did 
it was all right. And there he interpreted dreams. And, and, and he asked them, the baker and uh, the other one that brings the wine, cup bearer. He's, and, and, they, and, and he said, well, I have, I'm not here because I'm guilty. I'm un, I've done nothing wrong and I'm in this prison. Please remember, men, when you go out that they forgot him. A couple of years later, Pharaoh had a dream. And the cupbearer remembered that there was a man in the prison, a young man, and he interpreted the dreams from both of them, and it came exactly to pass. So it doesn't matter what the circumstances are around you. Stay faithful, and God will bless you. So Pharaoh's dream was seven fat cows come up out of the river. After that, seven ugly, thin cows came up, and they ate the seven fat cows, but you could not see the difference. They are just as thin and ugly as what they was before they did this. And when Joseph was brought in and he heard this dream, God gave him the interpretation, and he says, the two dreams that you have are the same. There will be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And then he advised them, in the years of plenty, gather as much as you can so that you have enough food even for the famine time that comes. And they say, who is better than you? Here he comes out of prison to be second in charge in Egypt. How is that possible? Never, never think that is in, nothing is impossible with God. God can take you from any place and he can raise you up and use you in the kingdom of God. I believe that we're living in a time to see much more of that. You are valuable in, the, in God's eyes. And God wants to bless you above everything, but be faithful and obedient. But remember now, Joseph is still separated from his family. So God wants to reconcile the family. How will he do that? Well, let's look at how God did it. In the second year of the famine, Jacob sent his ten sons to Egypt. He says, go and buy some food so that we can live and not die. And they went to Egypt and they bought a lot of food and they did not recognize their own brother because he spoke in the Egyptian language and he had other clothes on. They did not recognize him. Joseph really wanted to hug them, but he says, no, no, wait, wait, I'm not going to do it. So they came the second time to Egypt for food, and then Joseph revealed who he was. And he asked, how is my father? And they said, your father is still there, but he's still mourning about you. He says, come. And he asked Pharaoh to go home and to bring his father and the family which was 70 souls to Egypt. And the Bible says he gave them the best place in Egypt. So here is God's people, Abraham's seed, in the third generation already in Egypt. And it's going very well. Because Joseph is in charge, and, and he made a lot of blessings for them. But now, Jacob was very happy because the family is reconciled. We have to pray for that. I know there's lots of problems in families. Children doesn't want to serve their father and mother anymore. They say, I don't want to have anything to do with you. All these kinds of things is from the devil. We should do the right things in Jesus' name. And if it's not there, pray it into existence. 
So jo Joseph, Joseph's family was reconciled. And Joseph looked after them. But now after the famine was broken, it was supposed to go back. All right, maybe they can stay another year so that everything will be all right. But they did not. And then what happened? After 17 years that Jacob was in Egypt, 17 years already in Egypt, he said to Joseph, I'm now busy dying. Before he died, he said, make a promise that you will not bury me in Egypt because Egypt is not my land, my country. Egypt is not my inheritance. Inheritance is Canaan. Bury me in Canaan where I bought a place for Sarah, my wife, and she is buried there. So bury me there. But, you know, it went on. And they didn't go back. And Joseph was 110 years old when he died. That means they are already 70 years, maybe 60, 70 years in Egypt, and they did not return because it was so good in Egypt. Why? The blessings of God, the blessings of Abraham are still upon them. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, let's have a look what the Bible says, what happened to them. And this is the problem. When you are not in the place that God has called you to be, things will happen like this. In Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. About two and a half million to three million people. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to the people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happens in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Therefore, they said, taskmaster over them to afflict them with their burden. And they built for Pharaoh, supply city, Piton, and Ramses. What happened? Israel is now building the kingdom of Pharaoh. They're building cities. They're building the waterways. They're building the, the farms, everything. And Egypt is being blessed because of Israel. But it's not the place. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiply and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So what did the Egyptians do? Made the children of Israel serve with rigor. That's exactly how the devil works with, you, with the people. He catches you with something, and you feel, oh, well, it's nice to, to do this, to take some drugs or watch pornography or all these bad things, and it, oh, well, it's good, it is. But later on, he catches you, and it becomes worse and worse. Don't let this happen to you. They made their lives bitter and with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of services in the field. And all the service in which they made them serve was with rigor. In other words, they're still in Egypt, they're not out of Egypt. And why is this happening over them? Because they're not in the place that God called them to be. God called them that the fourth generation can come and inherit the land. But they didn't listen to God. That's why I say we have to be obedient to the voice of God. And we need to have faith. They were so blessed in the beginning. But later on they were really, really suffering. So Israel is now building the kingdom of Pharaoh, the kingdom of Egypt. Pharaoh and Egypt compares to Satan and his kingdom. Now listen to what I'm going to say now. Satan is using Israel to build his kingdom, not 
God's kingdom. His kingdom. In other words, God's people at that time was building the wrong kingdom. I think sometimes that we are doing the same thing. Don't build the wrong kingdom. We must build the right kingdom, the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, we find the prayer of Jesus that he said to us, we must pray on a daily basis, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Where? In heaven? Heaven, the kingdom of God is in heaven. We don't need to pray for the kingdom of God in heaven. It's already there. We need to pray that his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Are you praying for that? Jesus told us to pray. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is the kingdom of God already on heaven or on earth or not? I don't hear you. It's not on earth yet. It's coming. But the rulers of this world built their own kingdom. So I want to ask you, who's in charge of South Africa? Is God in charge or is the devil in charge? I can say we've got some wonderful people that serve God in government circles, but we also have the other side. And the other side looks to me stronger and they're building the kingdom of the world here in South Africa, but over the whole earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10 says, All these things happened to them, to Israel, as examples for you and me, and they were written for our admonition. We need to listen to the warnings of what happened with Israel in the Old Testament. Because when Israel served God, the country flourished. When Israel did not serve God, the enemy came in and destroyed. Still today, it will be the same. If we can get prayer in South Africa restored, the kingdom of God will come. Slowly but surely. But, you must be in the right place at the right time for God's blessing and for his inheritance to come to us. Israel is in the wrong place and should have come out earlier, but now Satan will not let you go. When, when Moses was raised up and says, let my people go, Pharaoh said, no. Satan is saying, no. No. I will not let my people that serve me and that's building my kingdom, I will not let them go. But we've got to have faith in God and say, Lord, release them. He doesn't want to do that. Remember in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it's a very important scripture for our time. It says, the kingdom of this world, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The kingdoms of this world. What have we today in this world? The kingdoms of the world. But what are we going to get in the future? The kingdom of God is raising up and will be higher than any other kingdom. And we know there are seven nations in the promised land, and they represent seven structures like government, education, and all those kinds of things. And I believe that God is going to raise up men and women, even from this place, that can take a high position in those places and start changing the nation like Joseph did with Egypt. And the blessing of God was on Egypt. So the blessing of God can come on our country. Hallelujah. What can't what kingdom are you building today? 
Are you building the kingdom of God? You say to me, Pastor Jan, what is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Listen, if that is in our country, we will have a beautiful country. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is, number one, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. All these things will come into the kingdom of God when the kingdom of God is here. Let me tell you something. You don't need to have a lot of keys when the kingdom of God is here because nobody will come into your house to steal. You don't need to lock your car anymore because everything is, is, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. It will be in our churches, it will be in our country, it will be the families. If we turn to the right place, what God showed us. So when we go to the second book in the Old Testament, is Exodus, we see a record of Israel's birth as a nation. And then the first five books is really the beginning until Joshua that means when Moses brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness. So they stayed for 400 years in Egypt. Far, far too long. Too many people are still in the Satan's kingdom serving the devil, not coming out to the place that God wants to, to be. But then they start crying out to God, and God sent Moses. He says, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. One man. One man. Go to Egypt. There is about three and a half million to, no, two and a half million to three million people. Bring them out. Wow. One man. Bring them out to bring them in. And what did Pharaoh do? No, I will not come. So God gave, spoke to Moses with plagues, and he brought ten plagues. The last one, the firstborn, will die from animals and from people. And everybody was mourning, and, and Pharaoh gave in. He says, take them out. Get out of my sight. And when they, <clears throat> when when they went out, let me tell you something, the time is coming that the church will have to fight because he doesn't want to lose the people in his kingdom. But you and I, we are free from the kingdom of the devil. Everybody is created by God, for God, for himself. God loves everybody that is being created. Created by God and for God. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, it says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Are you born of God? You will overcome the world. Just stay faithful and obedient. You will overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What? Our faith. It's your faith and obedience that will overcome everything. He who overcomes the world is he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hallelujah. This church believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Glory to God. Faith and obedience. So Moses let Israel out. And he brought them to the Red Sea. Now what must they do now in the Red Sea? When they stood in front of the Red Sea, they saw Pharaoh with all his soldiers and all his, his weapons came to take them back. Even when we get out, Satan will try and come back and take you back into his hands. 
So if you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you start serving him, Satan will do whatever he can to get you back. Moses opened the Red Sea because all Israel can walk through. So he had a rod and he opened the Red Sea and the people went through. And on the other side, Egypt was there and they was watching this. If they can go through that waters, we can go through. And they were so stupid, they went into the, into the river, into the sea, the Red Sea. And when they were down in the middle, God just released the water to flow and everyone died. And he says, the Egyptians that enslaved you, we will not see anymore. Oh God, this is our cry. Deal with our enemies so that we will not see them anymore. So when they are through on the other side, they were singing a song unto the Lord. In other words, the whole Israel people served God. They are now God's people. And they sang a song unto the Lord. But now, suddenly, they were out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness. And the wilderness is barren. No water, no food, no nothing. They had to learn to trust in God. When we accept Jesus Christ as the personal Savior, we'll have to trust in the Lord. So God supplied the water. He supplied the manna. He supplied the, the, the meat or the quails, quails at, at night. And, and, and the clothes did not wear out. And also a cloud during the day because it's very hot in the desert. And a, a pillar of fire at night to warm them up and to show the way and to give them a light, everything that they needed was supplied by God. This was Moses' ministry. I want you to listen to this very carefully. Moses' ministry was to take them out of Egypt to bring them in. But unfortunately, there was something that happened, which I tell you later. So now, Moses' ministry is to bring the people out, let me say, to get people saved and let them accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Then teach them how to trust in God for all the provision. That is Moses' ministry. So Moses handled all the complaints like the pastors of today, they do all this. But there was one small error that Moses did. When the people were complaining, there's no water, the Lord spoke to him and said, speak to the rock, and it will bring forth water. But he was so cross, and he took the rod, and he hit the rock twice, and the water came out, and Jesus said, that's not what I said to you. You were not obedient. You shall not bring my people into the promised land. Somebody else. I believe that many churches are in this realm. They preach to the people salvation. They preach to the people deliverance, healing, provision, all those wonderful things that we need. But they don't bring them into the promised land. I believe that we are living in the time that we are preparing the church for entering into the promised land. In other words, Moses' ministry is coming to an end. So, we're talking about the natural. That was in the natural. In the spiritually, it was us giving our life to the Lord, going into the wilderness for preparation and testing. The wilderness is really a preparation and testing. But then, when Moses was 120 years old, right in front of the promised land, God said to him, Come up onto the mountain and die. Come to me with God. And this is what has happened. In the mindset of the people today, they come out of sin, accept Jesus Christ, see the provision, what God provides for them, and then they want to die and go to heaven. 
right? That mindset has to change. Why? Because Moses is dead. Look in Joshua chapter 1, and verse 2 and 3. He said to Joshua, God spoke to him like he spoke to Moses in the beginning. Now it's Joshua. Joshua! Moses is dead. That ministry that brought them out of Egypt and supplied all the needs is over. You now need to take them and bring them into their inheritance. You say, no, no, Pastor Jan, my inheritance is heaven. I said, no. If you die, you will go to heaven. If I die, the Bible says, out of my body is to be presence with the Lord. I will go to heaven. But Jesus is waiting to come down to the earth. And all those in heaven that died in Christ, they will come with him on the clouds. And those that are still on the earth serving God will go up to meet the Lord in the air. And they will never be separated from God again. How long will they be in the air? I don't know. Three and a half years? Seven years? What does it matter if you are with the Lord Jesus Christ? Then time does not matter anymore. So what is it? Do we need to go? Is, is our vision just that we, we coming to the Lord... We see God's provision and we want to go to heaven to be with the Lord. That's the mindset for many generations in the house of God. God is now changing it to go a little bit further. You say, where to? I'll show you. Miss Moses' ministry was ordained by God. It was the right thing that you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the right thing that we saw the, how God provided for us. Yes. But he could not bring us into our inheritance. Heaven is automatically for God's people who die. But God comes to Joshua and he says now to him, Arise. Where to? Is God calling Joshua to heaven? No. Joshua, generation, needs to arise. Moses is dead. Moses' generation is past. The time that we had is past. Joshua generation is here to bring us into the inheritance that God has given to us spiritually. Remember, when John the Baptist started preaching, he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Not heaven, the kingdom. When Jesus started preaching, he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So I want to say the same thing. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, not repent for you, for you want to go to heaven. No, the kingdom first. We must first bring the kingdom of God from heaven to earth. You say to me, no, Pastor Jan, I don't want to be on this earth. I want to go to heaven and, and just be with the... Here on the earth, there's a lot of enemies. I don't want that. But you know what, 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 what God said to Joshua? Every place the sole of your foot will tread, that is on the board, but they took it off the board. Show it again. Joshua chapter 1, verse 2. Every place, that's in verse 3, where you put your feet. Every place that you put the sole of your feet, pop, I have given unto you. You see, it's the enemy territory. Yes, every place that you put your feet, 
I'll give to you. Joshua's generation is going to tread their feet into the territory that belongs to God's people, but the devil has stolen it. And we will go forward and take what the devil has stolen. Every place that you, Joshua generation, I believe that we are Joshua generation, when you put your foot into the enemy's territory, it's yours. It's yours. Hallelujah. Today, church has received authority from the Lord to, tra- to go forward into the enemy's territory and break the power of the enemy and cast him out of this earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26 It says, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The earth belongs to God. God created the earth and God's given the the earth to mankind to live in and to have authority and rule and reign. We lost it because the devil has started to steal it. And God says, now you take it back in the name of Jesus. You can't do it in your own power, but we can do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must bring heaven to the earth. You say to me, Pastor Jan, how, how on earth will we do this? Let me give you some seven points. Number one, God said to Joshua, prepare the people for in three days we will cross over. The duty of the church is to pray you. For in three days we will cross over. Put your mind on it. Not time to go to heaven now. It's time to cross over. Number two, the Ark of the Covenant will go before you. So the priest had to take the Ark of the Covenant. They had to go first. We as leaders must show the way. We must have the Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God. We must have the presence of God and walk before you so that the people can follow. Number three, The souls of the priest must step on the water. Remember, Jordan was not open like like Moses had his rod and he opened the Red Sea. The river Jordan is not opened in that way. The priest will have to carry the Ark of the Covenant and when they step on the river, on the feet, on the water, when they do that, it's faith and obedience. The water blocked up. Then, number four, priests who wore the ark, they had to go first, must stand still in the middle of the river. Now, it was in the time of, 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 of harvest, and it's a lot of rain. The, they, the, the river already overflowed on, the, on the, the walls. Now, you know, I, I thought, I said, Lord, if I was God, And thank God, I'm not God. I said, if I am God, I will wait till the rain stops. Then there's not so much water. But that's not God. For God, it doesn't matter. Nothing is impossible for God. So, as the priest walked forward, the water disappeared. And the river Jordan opened up for the people. Then, the Bible says they must stay in the middle of the river. Stop there. And wait for all the people to pass them to get over to the other side. I say this, God's leaders must understand the end time revelation that God is bringing. Because we are one to go forward. Number five. Instead of calling now those priests in the middle of the river out as soon as possible, I would have done that, but no, I'm not God. God has sent 12 men from every tribe, one man. Let them go back to where the Ark of the Covenant is in the middle of the river and let them take each one a stone and bring it out so that we can build a memorial for the 
Lord, so that our generations after us can see the memorial and say, this is what God did. He opened the River Jordan so that my people could go through. Number, and then, wait a minute, when they brought that out, he sends them back again. He says, now take another 12 stones and build a memorial in the middle of the River Jordan. I'm thinking, Lord, the water is, is getting higher and higher. Why do you do this? Why don't you get them out quickly? Only when they built the memorial of 12 stones where the ark was, they came out. And when they stepped out of the river, the river started to flow again. You see, this is things that we'll have to train the church. We need to, we need to cross over. Number six. After they crossed over, they are now in the, in the, prom, in the promised land. It's dangerous. There's seven nations in the promised land. So now what will God do to pre- preserve them? The enemies will come and, and wanted to kill them. You know what God said to them? Listen, all those people that were circumcised when you went into the wilderness for 40 years, they have died and went to be with God in heaven. That's what most of the church people think. We are just going to heaven. But now he says, circumcise the young generation that was not circumcised. I said, Lord, do you know that when you circumcise a man, he, he for seven days is useless. He can't do anything. What about if the enemy comes? Don't worry. If you are in God's hand, you are safe. Nothing happened to them. So I said, now, Lord, can we go and get the enemy? No, 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 not yet. Number seven. Celebrate the Passover feast. The Passover feast, they are remembering that the Lord Jesus Christ will deliver them. It happened in Egypt when they celebrate the Passover feast before they went out. Now they have to celebrate the Passover feast again. And for us, it means Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Be happy with him. And then... They had to go to Jericho, but that's for later because my time is up. I've got one minute left. So in Egypt, they had to build Satan's kingdom. In the wilderness was for preparation and testing. The promised land to deal with God's enemies and restore God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Have you got it? Remember that. Father, I come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I pray for your people in Fountain of Life. Wonderful people. I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord God, that you will help us to understand the end time that we need to go and take the inheritance which is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. We will see on this earth that God will rule this earth. And the church is here to bring the kingdom on earth. I pray, Lord God, that you will have open our mindset and our mindset will change. That it's not just getting saved and the provision of God and go to heaven. That it has been saved and the provision of God and then chase the enemy out of this earth because the earth belongs to the Lord and the meek will inherit the earth, and the Lord is coming to live for a thousand years on the earth with all the saints in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you will open up our understanding and see the wisdom of God for our day and our time in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord God, that this church will understand And that we will be an example for many churches in our nation. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Give him praise. Hallelujah.